Hello, I'm Gail Ewing, and welcome to Module 2 of the Masterclass on Identifying, Assessing and Supporting Informal Carers. This module is about getting started, introducing you to practice processes for identifying carers in palliative and end-of-life care. We'll start with a very brief recap of what we covered in Module 1 to set the scene then introduce you to the programme of research and implementation that forms the evidence base for this masterclass. To better support carers in palliative and end-of-life care requires some changes in practice, and we look at recommendations or building blocks for improving and sustaining carer support in practice. Then the module focuses on three core recommendations on identification of carers, demographic and contextual data, and carer records. We end with key learning points to take from Module 2. So to recap, in Module 1, we described the context of caregiving, with an overview of the importance of carers in end-of-life care, their contribution in terms of hours of care provided, and the many tasks completed, enabling patients to be cared for and remain at home towards the end of life, which most often is their preference. We also looked at the impact on all aspects of carers' health and well-being when they take on this caring role, something that many people are unprepared for. But we also know from research evidence that supporting carers makes a difference, improving outcomes, both when caring and in bereavement. In this module, we take this as our starting point, and we'll be looking at what needs to be put in place to improve carer support in routine practice. The information provided in this masterclass derives from a whole programme of research and implementation we've conducted on carer assessment and support at the Universities of Manchester and Cambridge. We've worked with a wide range of stakeholders, carers themselves, practitioners, policy and academic colleagues in a range of settings where carer assessment and support has been implemented in hospices, hospital, primary and community care. The direct quotes included in the masterclass derive from this research programme. Palliative and end-of-life care has a strong ethos of not just providing care for the patient, but also supporting the carer and wider family. The service remit extends to this wider unit of care. However, we know from our research studies that routine carer identification, assessment and support does not always happen, much though end-of-life care policy recommends that it should. Instead, processes can be rather ad hoc, with carers being asked how they are within the patient assessment, and this can leave carers reluctant to raise any needs they have either to help them care for the patient or particularly any related to their own health and well-being. And this is true across all settings, in hospice care, in hospital and in the community. So how can we begin to address this situation? What change in practice is required to better identify and support carers as individuals with their own needs? in a palliative and end-of-life care context. To achieve the change needed for a more consistent and equitable approach for carers involves a change at the level of individual practitioners, looking at how they can better identify and support carers in their day-to-day -day practice. But this is only part of the picture. Change needs to be considered at system level, looking at stakeholders, structures and processes within general practice to successfully implement and sustain support for carers. 
The principles are common for other improvements in practice, but here we're going to look at them in relation to carer identification and support. We've worked over many years with hospices, specialist palliative care, as well as stakeholders from acute, primary and community care to identify the main building blocks that need to be in place to improve and sustain carer assessment and support within healthcare services. This has resulted in 10 key recommendations. Four of these are core requirements for facilitating carer assessment and support. The remaining six are required to support and sustain its implementation and practice. Let's look at these 10 recommendations in a bit more detail. There are four core building blocks that need to be in place for a practice to begin to deliver assessment and support for carers beginning with identification of carers within the practice, an essential first step towards supporting them. Demographic and contextual data is needed on who the carer is and their situation to aid communication with carers and awareness of their circumstances. A recording system is needed for carer information, separate from patient data, but with record linkage to the patient who is supported by the carer. And lastly, a method or protocol for assessing carers and responding to the assessment. This is about moving away from inferring that carers are not coping to assessing why they are not coping and what would help from their perspective. The other six are recommendations to implement and sustain carer assessment and support in practice. This includes a process for training practitioners to ensure everyone involved is aware of protocols and, importantly, confident about using them. Available time and workload capacity required to plan, implement and sustain carer assessment and support. Senior management support is key to provide the leadership and authority to make required changes and ensure dedicated time and capacity is required. And role models, champions for carers as facilitators within teams to embed carer identification, assessment and support. Pathways for communication to ensure common purpose and procedures problem solving and sharing of good practice. And finally, procedures for monitoring process and outcomes of carer assessment and support to assess progress towards targets, enable review and communicate activity. You can probably see how these principles resonate with any practice change or challenge. For example, in caring for patients, you may work through any of these principles Am I consistently identifying the client or patient with the problem? Do I have the background information I need? Is the assessment process I use for diagnosing the problem comprehensive? And does it take account of the patient's perspective? And so on. However, with carers in palliative and end-of-life care, we have the additional challenge that we noted earlier. They are part of the unit of care but it's not always clear exactly where they fit and who is responsible for supporting them. So for the remaining modules of the masterclass, we're going to look at the different recommendations in more detail and specifically how they relate to improvement in carer assessment and support during palliative and end of life care. We'll begin in this module by looking at three of the core recommendations on identifying carers, their demographic and contextual data, and carer record systems. For the fourth core recommendation on a protocol for assessing carers and responding to the assessment, the masterclass includes different resources you can access on supporting carers in palliative and end-of-life care from organisations such as Macmillan, Marie Curie, as well as the RCGP. 
However, in some cases, these move from the process of identification of the carer to signposting to various generic sources for support. It's worth remembering that while signposting can be helpful for carers, without an understanding of the carer's individual situation, the support provided may not meet their specific needs. So for those of you who are interested in delivering more comprehensive, person-centred process of assessment and support for carers, Module 4 introduces you to such an approach, including how to access training. The remaining recommendations you can see here are addressed in Module 3. There, the focus is on organisational context for supporting carers and how practices can put these into action to better deliver carer support. In order to provide support, we need to know who the carers are in the first place. This is where general practice is in a unique position to identify carers, unlike the other services providing palliative and end-of-life care. And this is for two reasons. First, we know that most of the last year of life is spent at home under the care of the general practice team. Only a small percentage of patients and carers are seen by specialist services. And second, the carers are clients, patients themselves, of general practice and therefore have their own records. On the face of it, this may not seem terribly significant. But carer records, or certainly the lack of a record system for carers in other settings like hospital, hospice or community care, is a major barrier in the process of identifying and supporting carers in palliative and end-of-life care. Thus, not only does primary care have the potential for identifying the majority of carers, in primary care there's a real opportunity to record an evidence support provided for them. An essential first step in supporting carers is having an effective process for identifying them. If you don't know who the main carer or carers are, you don't even have a starting point. Any process of identification needs to have certain key features. It needs to be systematic and consistent. A process which enables all carers to be identified, not just some. Throughout our studies with carers, consistency has been the characteristic that has most often been missing in practice, and the one identified by stakeholders as most needed across all aspects of support for carers. This study participant summed up the situation. The key word is consistent, because I think at the moment carer identification is quite kind of ad hoc down to sort of goodwill, good practice. And if it's consistent, that suggests every carer will get identified. So it kind of formalises the process. It puts carers on an equal setting with the patient, which is what the legislation says nowadays. Identification also needs to be proactive by the organisation or practice because carers so often will not self-identify. It may simply not occur to them to let anyone know they are having problems with caring, like this carer explained. I was looking after my wife, and it never occurred to me to go and ask the doctor about myself. I was constantly looking after my wife, and that was it. My needs were second, and I never approached them and said, Look, I'm struggling here. I would just miss it and carry on. A common feature across all our studies with carers has been their focus on the needs of the patient and their reluctance to move any attention from the patient to themselves. In any process of identification, it's also important to try and avoid using the term carer because many people see themselves in relationship terms to the person they're caring for, the husband or wife of the person who is ill, a son or a daughter. 
And this is especially the case if you think back to the definition of a carer we looked at in Module 1, where that caring role involves more emotion management than actual hands-on care. Marie Curie has developed a video library for carers called Taking Care. It has over 400 short clips of carers and professionals speaking candidly about the caring journey, what helped them and what they wish someone had told them. The guide to the video content developed for professionals who work with carers is included in the Masterclass resources. This includes a very short video about how people don't always recognise themselves as a carer. Developing a process for identifying carers in the practice needs to start with the patients, those who are palliative, registered with the practice. You may already have an alert system on the practice record when these patients are seen, or a palliative care register. Alternatively, a simple question to ask is, who is your main source of support? who is not a healthcare professional. This question is really useful because it avoids confusion between next of kin and who is the main carer. And as we saw earlier, patients and carers don't always recognize the carer label. And this question simply asks who supports them. You may also want to think about the language used on notice boards in the practice. Instead of having a carer section on the notice board, you may want to get people's attention and direct them to the information by using a question like, do you regularly provide help and support to a relative or friend? Electronic message boards can be used in the same way. You also need to consider who in the practice might take on this role in identification of carers. It could be a flag to admin support when the patient attends for an appointment. And in Module 3, we discuss more about administrative champions for carers within general practice. It could be a flag to the GP on the record system to ask this question when they see the patient. Or to the practice nurse, for example, when doing over 60 checks or flu jabs. It will depend on your practice team how this will work best in your individual situation. There are some further suggestions on identifying carers in the 60 second guide from Carers Trust, which you can download from the resources section of the masterclass. Data on who the carer is and their situation are essential to underpin processes of carer assessment and support. But in palliative and end-of-life care, even basic data on carers can be missing across settings, even in hospices whose ethos includes the carer. This should be less of an issue in primary care, provided an identification system is put in place, because basic demographics like name, address and contact details should be complete in their own record as a patient within the practice. But carers themselves have identified other contextual data they felt should be recorded about their caring situation. This includes distinguishing main carers from those who are next of kin, knowing whether carers are in employment or not, and importantly, any other additional caring responsibilities they have. These details can be recorded on the practice's carer's register, but information needs to be updated as circumstances change. In Module 3, we discuss the role of administrative champions who can play a role in maintaining a carer's register. The last of the core recommendations relates to carer records. And as we said earlier, the record system in general practice facilitates recording of carer information, which is important for access and retrieval. However, practices also need to consider how they will ensure its completion and determine who will take on this role. This is something discussed further in Module 3 
about administrative champions for carers. Beyond the data themselves, our studies have identified two further key issues to be considered. To better understand the context of their caring role, there is a need for some kind of flagging system to link the carer's record with that of the patient they care for. Where patient and carer are registered with the same practice, this is more simple to deal with, linking the records together. More of a problem is when carers are not registered with the patient's practice. Daffodil standard number three on carer support anticipates this situation arising and encourages practices to develop inter-practice communication systems. There's practice guidance from the RCGP on issues of consent, confidentiality of information and information governance when sharing information with other practices and the wider health and social care system. This brings us to the end of this module on identifying carers. There are a number of key learning points to take away. Improving support for carers in palliative and end-of-life care requires practice change. A set of 10 evidence-based recommendations provide the building blocks for improved carer identification, assessment and support. General practice is well placed to implement the core recommendations for effective carer identification, a systematic, proactive process to collect data on carers and their situation that is consistently recorded enabling equity for carers at end of life.